Uh, my name is Dr. Hector Flores, and I'm the chairman of Family Medicine at White Memorial Medical Center in East Los Angeles, which is one of the areas that is hit the hardest by this pandemic. So this topic is of major interest to our community. Tonight, we have three of the top experts in medicine and science in the LA County Department of Public Health to answer your questions about the COVID-19 vaccine from where we are now and where we are heading in the months to come. In the next 90 minutes, we will cover important vaccine-related topics, including current vaccine phases, safety updates, facts and myths, and anticipate barriers regarding the vaccine procurement and distribution process for LA County. In this context, it's also important to remember that LA County is home to 10 million people, it's fully one-fourth of the state's population, and it is characterized by racial, ethnic, mixed immigration status, and socioeconomic diversity that is unparalleled elsewhere in the state. And, and with over 500,000 healthcare workers, from doctors to dentists to nurses, pharmacists, hospitals, to community health workers and home health agencies, we have our work cut out to fully immunize all of them as we also begin to immunize the high-risk population amongst us. I wanna thank all of you who have already submitted questions and we know that in the past two days, more issues have come up. So I know our speakers will be addressing some of the latest on that. Uh, and we're looking forward to the questions that you will submit as we go through this town hall. So far, we've received over 750 questions uh, in an effort to answer the most commonly uh, asked questions. We're gonna ask each of our speakers to give some opening comments. I think that will help the flow of our town hall this evening and we'll spend about 30 to 45 minutes doing that. And then we will go to the questions that have been pre-submitted as well as those that you are submitting. And as a reminder, you can submit your questions during the town hall in the uh, comment section in YouTube and Facebook, and also on Twitter using hashtag AskCOVIDTownHall. Again, hashtag AskCOVIDTownHall. And uh, if you'd like to listen in Spanish, you can call 888 Six six four one four five three, uh, and that's eight 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 six six four one four five three. Para los que hablan español, uh, les pedimos que pueden llamar al número ocho 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 seis seis cuatro uno cuatro cinco tres para poder escuchar estos eventos en español. Uh, les repito el número es ocho 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 seis seis cuatro uno cuatro cinco tres. Um, also, uh, we have uh, um, Chinese language available as well, and it's, uh, you can call 888-664-1459. Uh, again, uh, to hear this in, in Chinese, the number is 888-664-1459. And also, it's available in Korean at 888-664-1454. Again, in Korean at 888-664-1454. 6641454. Okay, let's begin with introductions of our panelists. Uh, first, we, uh, we have Dr. Paul Simon, who is the Public Health Chief Science Officer. And Dr. Simon, uh, we'd uh, welcome you to give your opening comments to our audience today. Thank you, Dr. Flores, and good evening, everyone. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to begin the discussion tonight with some background information on the COVID 19 vaccines. As you've probably heard, there are two COVID-19 vaccines that have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Both vaccines were found to be highly effective and very safe in the clinical trials that were done prior to their approval. The Pfizer trial included over 40, I'm sorry, 40,000 participants 16 years of age and older, and the Moderna trial included over 30,000 participants 18 and older. Very importantly, both trials showed the vaccines to be highly effective across all age groups and racial ethnic groups and among both women and men. The vaccines were also very effective among persons with chronic health conditions, such as heart disease and diabetes that increase risk for severe COVID-19 disease. While the trials demonstrated the vaccines to be approximately 95% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 disease, they were not designed to determine if the vaccines prevent asymptomatic infection and further spread of the virus. For this reason, we recommend that all persons who are vaccinated continue to take precautions such as wearing a face mask and following physical distancing guidelines until additional studies are completed. As with many vaccines, local and systemic reactions do sometimes occur 
following vaccination with the COVID-19 vaccines, including soreness, redness, swelling at the site of injection, fatigue, headache, muscle ache, fever, and or chills. However, these symptoms are usually mild and only last a day or two. The symptoms can be treated with acetaminophen or other over-the-counter pain and fever medications and should not discourage anyone from receiving the second dose of vaccine. You may have heard about a much more severe adverse reaction called anaphylaxis, a potentially life-threatening, though treatable, allergic reaction that has occurred in some persons shortly after receiving the vaccine. These reactions are very rare. A study done by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention identified 21 such cases of anaphylaxis among nearly 2 million persons who were vaccinated. No deaths were reported. You may have also heard on the news just in the last few days a cluster of cases of anaphylaxis following vaccination among six healthcare workers down in San Diego. Those cases are currently under investigation and in an abundance of caution, uh, the state has recommended that the particular vaccine lot that had been used there be held for the time being until the cases are fully investigated. And we're hopeful then that uh, the, that vaccine supply can then be continued. But uh, again, we're erring on the side of caution here. There's no evidence to date that uh, those reactions were directly attributable to the vaccine or something unique about the vaccine. It is important though to note that these adverse events highlight the importance of vaccination providers having medication and equipment available to treat anaphylaxis should it occur. Again, this adverse reaction is very rare. You may have also recently heard in the news the emergence of several variants of the COVID-19 virus that may be more contagious. First, let me say that it is no surprise that these variants are appearing given the nature of the coronavirus. Like the flu virus, the genetic material in the coronavirus is RNA, which is prone to errors or mutations when it replicates, leading to variants. There is legitimate concern that one variant in particular from the United Kingdom is more transmissible and has spread to the United States and California. One case has been identified in Los Angeles County, and we believe there are likely many more in the county that have not yet been identified. The CDC has predicted that this strain may become the dominant strain in the U.S. over the next several months. Fortunately, the current evidence suggests that the COVID-19 vaccines are effective against this variant. However, however, its rapid spread highlights the critical importance of consistent use of the face masks and physical distancing when out in public or with persons outside your household. The presence of this variant also highlights the importance of getting as many persons vaccinated as quickly as possible. To facilitate this process, we wanna make sure you have accurate information about the vaccines and the vaccination process. And so we much appreciate your having taken the time this evening to attend this town hall. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Flores. Thank you, Dr. Simon. And uh, tonight we're also very fortunate to have Dr. Sarah Curian. She's the uh, Director of Medical Affairs for Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. And she is one of the leaders in the vaccine efforts and distribution, and she'll be sharing some thoughts about those plans. Dr. Curran. Thank you, Dr. Flores. So as we begin planning for the vaccination efforts, we recognize that this will be a massive undertaking, given the urgency of vaccinating millions of people in the county. But we know that we're not alone. There have been hundreds of people people's organizations and many county departments involved in organizing and facilitating this undertaking. And we're very happy to see so many partners involved. As many know, we have been, we began vaccinations in December, starting with our frontline healthcare workers and the staff and residents at more than 300 skilled nursing facilities in the county. Vaccines were initially being administered at more than 10, more than 80 acute care hospitals where we needed nurses, doctors, and other medical teams to be immunized and safe while they continued their heroic efforts to save people infected with COVID-19. This is even more evident since our hospitals have become filled with COVID-19 patients. We're extremely pleased with the progress at our skilled nursing facilities where we have immunized more than 65% of the most vulnerable populations, such as our seniors who are living in these facilities. This was accomplished through the really hard work of the skilled nursing facilities themselves and the work of strike teams from LA City the Department of Public Health and our curative partner. As we've been ramping up, we established partnerships with pharmacies, federally qualified health centers, 
hospitals and clinics, as well as set up more than 20 special closed points of dispensing to make sure that healthcare workers who are not located at an acute care hospital can also get vaccinated. The Federal Pharmacy Partnership has also been turned on and appointments for vaccinations in long-term care facilities through CVS and Walgreens are also now well underway. To further expedite vaccinations, today we opened five large capacity sites. These locations, along with similar mass vaccination centers that opened last Friday at Dodger Stadium, will help us vaccinate more than 200,000 individuals over the next two weeks. Vaccination appointments that are available are posted on our website. Starting today, LA County residents 65 years and older can also go to vaccinatelacounty.com to sign up for an appointment at both the large capacity vaccination sites and at other smaller vaccination sites across the county. We estimate that we have about 300,000 remaining healthcare workers and over 1 million individuals 65 and over to vaccinate. The pace of vaccinations is entirely dependent upon the doses that we receive from the federal government and the state. Through last week, we had received about 685,000 doses and over 70% of these doses have been administered. New doses, about 168,000 are, are arriving today and tomorrow, which will be used by registered sites to administer vaccines this week. We are not yet sure about our allocation for next week, which will also need to be used to cover those healthcare workers that need their second doses. We are grateful for everyone's patience and understanding since as you can see, we have very limited vaccine supply. And this means that we can only offer a limited number of appointments each week. As vaccine availability increases, so will the number of appointments. Please go to our website regularly for updates and to sign up for our newsletter to know when we're ready for future phases. One thing I do want to warn everyone about is to be watchful for scams. Already law enforcement has investigated a couple of reports of places that look like a medical clinic giving out COVID-19 vaccinations to anyone who walked in and asked for a vaccine. These are not legal sites, especially if they're located in an alley, behind a grocery store, or other places that seem suspicious. If you hear about these places, please report them to the Sheriff's Department or Police Department. In closing, I want to emphasize that we remain committed to ensuring vaccines are distributed in a fair and equitable manner. Access to vaccinations is and will remain our priority, so no one is cutting in front of the line. As we progress through phase 1B, we will see how the pace of vaccines are arriving to LA County, and we'll have a better idea of when general public vaccinations will be available. Right now, we are estimating that this will be possible in late spring or early summer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kurian. I appreciate those thoughts. And uh, next, uh, also equally uh, fortunate to have Dr. Eloisa Gonzalez, who is the Director of Cardiovascular and School Health for Public Health. And she's working in the, in the liaison section for the COVID uh, response. And she's got some insights, uh, her ears to the ground in terms of what the community is concerned about. Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Dr. Flores. I'm honored to be here with you all tonight. I'd like to take a few minutes discussing some of the myths, rumors, and misinformation that we're hearing regarding these vaccines. We recognize that everyone wants information about this, which is why we posted a wealth of information on our website, including a myths and facts sheet regarding some of the most common questions we hear. I would like to emphasize that if you have a question, if you want to get accurate information, please visit our website, vaccinatelacounty.com. Click the translate button at the top of the page to view it in other languages. Be sure to check out the vaccine information page. It addresses a lot of common questions. As Dr. Simon said earlier, the vaccines developed for COVID-19 were done according to the highest medical standards with our safety in mind. However, just as the coronavirus can easily spread if we're unprotected and not immunized, rumors can run pretty fast across the internet, across social media, and across the street if left unchecked. So let me address a few of them. First, was the COVID vaccine developed using aborted fetuses, or does the vaccine include components of aborted fetuses? This issue came up in December when the Pope issued a statement that essentially said it was morally acceptable to use COVID-19 vaccines that use the cell lines of aborted fetuses in the research and production process, if an alternative was not available. 
The truth is that no fetal cells have been used to make any of the COVID-19 vaccines now in use. The two vaccines we are using now in the USA, Pfizer and Moderna, developed their vaccines through a new process, what's commonly referred to as the mRNA process, which is a more efficient method of producing mass quantities of vaccine. Another way to produce mass quantities of vaccine is to use what's called an adenovirus. Adenovirus vaccines for COVID-19 are currently under development and will be reviewed by the FDA. We will discuss those vaccines once they are approved for use. Now, let's shift our attention to another rumor. For instance, some believe that COVID-19 is a pandemic, meaning that it was intentionally created by the government or a political group to reduce the populations of certain groups. This is not true. This virus, like a lot of other viruses that have spread around the world over centuries, is simply part of nature. Viruses of all kinds exist in our world and can turn deadly, like Ebola. Influenza is a virus. Polio is a virus. SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, is also a virus. Another myth uh, is that the vaccine rollout is intentionally slow so that more people will die before they can get vaccinated as a means of population control. The truth is that vaccination rollout has been significantly slowed by a number of factors, including the need for specific refrigeration of mRNA vaccines. That kind of refrigeration is not always available at many traditional vaccination locations, which has uh, delayed the vaccine rollout. Another piece of misinformation that is uh, still out there is that COVID-19 is no more lethal than the flu, that the media or the government is making a bigger deal of it for whatever reason. I think the evidence is pretty clear at this point. COVID-19 is many times more lethal than the flu. Before COVID-19 in 2018, LA County had 98 deaths from the flu in uh, about one year. So far, in just over one year, we have lost more than 13,000 people in LA County to COVID. Another question we hear in the Hispanic community is if I go and get a vaccine, I'll be deported or I face the consequences of the public charge rule. Here's the bottom line. Everyone needs to get vaccinated. Your health is too important. The federal government announced over the summer that immigrants can get tested and immunized without fearing any consequence of the public charge rule. Right now, the Latino population in Los Angeles County is suffering from the highest ratio of COVID-19 cases and deaths. That must stop. There are many organizations in Los Angeles County that will be reaching out to all Latinos to help get them vaccinated for free without fear. I'll repeat this last part in Spanish. Por último, otros mensajes que circulan de boca en boca en las redes sociales y que escuchamos seguidamente en nuestra comunidad hispana y nuestros inmigrantes sin documentos es el temor a la deportación. Por ejemplo, muchos sienten miedo y dicen, si voy y me pongo la vacuna, seré deportado o me señalarán como una carga pública y eso afectará mis trámites de legalización. Aquí está la conclusión. Todos deben vacunarse. Su salud es demasiado importante. El gobierno federal anunció durante el verano que los inmigrantes pueden hacerse la prueba y vacunarse sin temor a la deportación o ninguna consecuencia de la regla de carga pública del gobierno federal. En este momento, la población latina en el condado de Los Ángeles está sufriendo la proporción más alta de casos y fallecimientos por causas del COVID-19. Esto debe terminar. Hay muchas organizaciones en el condado de Los Ángeles que se acercarán para apoyar a toda la comunidad latina e informarse y vacunarse gratis y sin ningún temor. Again, I encourage everyone to keep checking our website for accurate information vaccinatelacounty.com. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Flores. Thank you so thank much, you. Dr. Gonzalez. And I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Simon, Dr. Curry, and Dr. Gonzalez for these great opening comments, uh, in particular, giving us the big picture, the science behind the vaccine, 
the logistics of uh, distributing the vaccine in a fair and equitable manner and the myths and facts that exist about this. Uh, now we get to the really the most important part of this town hall, and that's really to answer your questions. And um, we're going to start off with the pre-submitted questions as we collect live uh, the, the questions that you're submitting. And again, as a reminder, you can still submit questions uh, using the comment section of YouTube and Facebook. And uh, you can use the Twitter uh, account using hashtag AskCOVIDTownHall. So let me start off with the first question, uh, Dr. Kurian. Uh, why, does it, why does it seem that like Los Angeles County is having a harder time distributing the vaccine in places like Orange County or Riverside? Thanks, Dr. Flores. So there are a couple of things um, that are important to consider. Uh, first of all, Los Angeles County has over 10 million residents and approximately 8 million of them meet the age requirements for the current vaccines um, in terms of being over the age of 16 or 18. So we have a lot of people who were responsible for vaccinating, so far more than in other counties. Um, so you can expect that it's going to take us a bit longer to get through our priority groups. The other thing to note is, again, that the pace of vaccinations is entirely dependent upon, upon the doses that we receive from the federal government and the state. So we're definitely not trying to hold on to vaccine. And as soon as vaccine comes into the county, it's either directly shipped to our partners or used to support these points of dispensing that host, for example, these mass vaccination clinics. So we're hoping that soon we'll get larger shipments into the county because that is what will really enable us to further ramp up our efforts. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is really for Dr. Simon. Um, the question is, is when will uh, the vaccine be available to uh, individuals under 16 years old? The short answer is we don't know. Um, <clears throat> we do know that um, the um, vaccine companies have expanded to include children at least down to age 12, but there's no information at least that I've seen in how quickly those trials will be completed. We do know that this population clearly is an important population to, to vaccinate. Um, to date, overall, in Los Angeles County, we've had over 1 million reported cases of COVID in, in all age groups, and we've seen over 100,000 in children and adolescents. So this is, even in that young age group, a very significant problem. Fortunately, children are much less likely to become ill with the infection than adults and particularly older adults. Not to say that they never get ill. We do on occasion see children hospitalized um, with COVID, but the vast majority will either have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. But in addition, they can spread the virus. And uh, I think you mentioned in the question the, the issue of schools. And if we want schools to be safe, uh, clearly, we want both teachers and other staff and the children to be free of infection. The highest priority, though, uh, has been and will continue to be at least uh, over the next three to four months, vaccinating adults. And in the school environment, a very important priority is vaccinating the teachers and other staff that are serving the children and the families. Thank you, Dr. Simon. Uh, the next question uh, applies maybe both to Dr. Kurian and Dr. Gonzalez. Um, when will the vaccine be available to the most vulnerable and most affected communities, uh, Black, Latino, low income, uh, as well as Native Hawaiians and uh, Native Americans? So um, I'm, I'm happy to start, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, and then feel free to fill in uh, any additional points that you'd like to bring up. So I'll just mention that our vaccine rollout is based on priority population determinations that have been decided at the federal and state levels and is based primarily on, for example, the type of job that you do and the risk of COVID-19 exposure that that job entails. So right now, vaccine is available to all healthcare workers and residents of skilled nursing facilities or long-term care facilities. And, and as of today, uh, to individuals over the age of 65, regardless of race or socioeconomic status, we do make an effort to onboard facilities, pharmacies, and clinics that are located broadly across the county, including in communities of color, to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity to access the vaccine. Uh, okay. Dr. Gonzalez, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yep. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Curry, and that was great. I really had very little to add other than just to, to emphasize what you said, um, which is that we are really prioritizing uh, equitable distribution of the vaccine across the county, and we have made sure that we had at least one megapod in, one, you know, in the various geographic parts of the county to make sure that all individuals have access once their group becomes eligible for it. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Simon. Uh, when should we expect the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines to, to come out and, and how will they help? Well, we're looking forward to additional vaccines becoming available. As has been mentioned, uh, you know, the supply chain is an issue. We, we, we're going to need to really ramp up the volume of vaccines received to be able to meet our, our goals in terms of vaccinating the the population as quickly as possible. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine has been approved in the United Kingdom and in several other countries, I believe, and it, they're fairly far along here in their phase three clinical trials, uh, clinical trial, which is the definitive trial. And I'm hopeful that they'll be submitting data soon. It could be within a matter of several weeks. It will then require careful review by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and their advisory committee. Um, so, you know, we can't assume that a vaccine will be approved until we see the data. We want to make sure it's it's safe, most importantly, and also uh, very effective. The Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, likewise, is in phase three of its clinical trial. And similarly, uh, we've heard rumblings that uh, they may, in the next month or two, uh, be completing their trial and submitting data. What's particularly exciting, I think, about that vaccine is that it only requires a single dose. The other uh, two that are currently approved, Pfizer and Moderna, require two doses, as does the AstraZeneca vaccine. And having uh, a vaccine available requiring only one dose would clearly allow us then to, you know, expand our vaccination efforts, reach a, a larger portion of the population much more quickly. Thank you. And along those lines, uh, Dr. Kurian, we're hearing that there was supposed to be a stockpile of uh, Pfizer and Moderna, and now it seems like it's empty. So what are the prospects of fixing that and getting more vaccine uh, to our county? Yeah, uh, I, I know that there's been some concern about, you know, um, whether the government actually has enough doses left uh, or whether they've run out. Um, and, you know, the, the reality is that doses of the vaccine continue to be manufactured and delivered to the states through the federal government. Uh, there hasn't been a halt in production of the vaccine. Um, as you noted, it was originally thought that there were reserves that the, the federal government was holding to distribute the second doses that could be opened up to increase the flow of vaccine coming into the counties. Um, but because it's unclear how much uh, in any of those reserves are available, what will most likely happen is that we'll probably not be seeing a huge increase in number of doses coming into us every week, uh, but we are expecting to still be receiving the vaccine doses at the current rate um, and at the current levels, at least for the short time. Thank you. And, and, and kind of a follow up to that and for Dr. Simon as well, um, for folks who already got one, uh, the first dose of either Moderna or uh, Pfizer, uh, what's being done to ensure that they can get the second dose, and uh, and then how does how does that planning uh, work out over over time? Either Dr. Curran or Dr. Simon. I'll start, but, but then I'll defer to Dr. Curran. I think we, you know, in in some places around the world, um, the decision is made to prioritize the first dose to get as many numbers of first doses in people as possible with the understanding that there may not be enough vaccine then to give the second dose. So in other words, to delay that second dose. We at this point don't believe that's the best course of action given the vaccine trials, which clearly showed that the benefit, while there is some benefit after the first dose, the optimal benefit is really after two doses spaced apart by just 21 days for Pfizer and 28 days for Moderna. And so we are being, we're monitoring very closely our first dose vaccines, um, trying to anticipate what we're gonna be receiving over the next several weeks to month. 
uh, not all, you know, but not knowing for sure. And, and so being a little bit cautious in terms of how many first doses we administer, wanting to make sure that those that do get that first dose have available vaccine for the second dose. Yeah, and, and um, that's exactly right, Paul. And I, I think, um, you know, so far we've been fortunate and they have been, the, the state and the federal government has been sending us down allocations of second doses. Um, so we have those doses available to give to those individuals who uh, require their second dose. I think what we are going to be monitoring very closely is what the um, influx of first doses are going to be um, to see if there is going to be any need to, to make modifications as we move forward uh, in terms of how we start using some of the second doses. Great, thank you. And uh, for Dr. Gonzalez, um, this is a question we get in our practice quite a bit too, is how do we convince our elders? How do we, how I, this the question is, how do I convince my grandmother to get the vaccine? Because she thinks or she's heard that she will get COVID. That you're on mute, Astella. My apologies. Uh, that's a great question, Dr. Flores. Um, thank you. None of the COVID-19 vaccines being developed or now in use in the United States have the virus that causes COVID-19 in them. To stress, no live virus, no weakened virus, no dead virus. You just cannot get the disease from the vaccine. Sometimes people get a fever or feel tired for a day or so after getting the vaccine. Uh, those symptoms are normal and they're a sign that the body is building immunity. Uh, it takes a few weeks for the body to build immunity after vaccination. So if a person got infected with the virus that causes COVID-19 while they were out and about in the community or from a household member, and that happened just before or just after they got their vaccine, they could still get COVID. And that's because the vaccine has not had enough time to provide protection. Thank you. And another uh, a related question, uh, this would be for Dr. Simon, I believe, um, is that the, the serious reactions, the allergic reactions of others to, to the vaccine, uh, where is LA County in that? And what is the general experience with the two vaccines that are out, Pfizer and, and Moderna? So we have vaccinated more than 300,000 persons in Los Angeles County so far. And we've not heard of any serious adverse reactions. There certainly are many folks that experience the expected local and systemic reactions, uh, what's previously been mentioned, things like soreness at the injection site, fatigue, headache, on occasion fever, chills, but nothing more serious. There are very likely have been mild allergic reactions because, again, those happen on occasion, I think in about one in 10,000, um, but we've not heard about any serious uh, reactions such as anaphylaxis. We're watching very closely. In addition, it's important for folks to be aware that there is a national monitoring system. It's called VAERS, V-A-E-R-S. It stands for Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. It's operated by both the FDA and the CDC. And healthcare providers are actually required to report any serious adverse reaction, as well as any error in administration of the vaccine. In addition, though, um, individuals, people who've been vaccinated or their family members can report directly to VAERS. It's, it's easy to find on, on the internet. You just uh, you know, search for VAERS, V-A-E-R-S, you get right to the site. And you can, if you've had an adverse reaction, you can report that. The CDC is also uh, developed an app called vSafe that you can load on your phone, your smartphone, and uh, you can, through that vehicle, report an adverse reaction. And in addition, there's the opportunity for two-way communication with that app. Uh, you'll re you can also receive uh, information about the vaccine and about COVID. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, basically, it just provides more real-time uh, communication potential. They provide a reminder uh, for when you need your second dose, for example. 
Great. And just to follow up, Dr. Simon, how is that data going to be collected and reported to the public so that it's, it's constantly as close to real time information for the public? Yeah, so I don't know what the schedule is, but the, the CDC tends to be very transparent in what they call their surveillance data. This is post-marketing surveillance data, and it's it's often called data for action. So it's not meant to you know sit <laughs> sit uh, idly on a computer. Um, and so generally, they produce surveillance reports at regular intervals. And certainly, if there's a concern, if there is an unusual adverse uh, event or something serious that's being reported, then they do issue alerts very quickly. Thank you. And that is so timely, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. One of the questions we received was um, an individual saying, I see friends on social media posting about COVID and the vaccine, but I'm not sure what's true. They say the vaccine hasn't been tested on Black people, so they don't know what the side effects are. Is that true? And, and, and what are some of the other myths you're hearing about? That's another great and important question, Dr. Flores. Thank you. Uh, the stakes for Black and Latinx residents of LA County are very high. There are certainly historical reasons for Black and Latinx communities to fear being singled out. Uh, the concern is justified because people of color and marginalized groups have in the past been coerced and subjugated to participating in drug trials and medical procedures without informed consent. Uh, or patient protections or ethical practices. That's not the case here. However, um, Black and Latinx communities have not been singled out to get the vaccine, but groups are being offered the vaccine based on the risk factors uh, faced by the people in the group, as Dr. Kurian mentioned earlier. So the answer is no to singling anyone out, but yes, Latin uh, Latin X and Black communities could be offered the vaccines earlier than other communities where infection, hospitalization, and death rates have not been as high. Um, I encourage people to read what they can about the vaccines from reliable sources and also talk to well-informed people that you trust, like your doctor, a science teacher you know, a pharmacist, and you know, have them ask um, or ask them your questions and have them respond to your questions um, and to your concerns as well. Thank you. And this next question uh, would be, I guess, both for you, Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Kurian, uh, is how do we define essential workers and how do we reach out to them? Uh, and what, what would be the unique game plan for them? So I can start, Eloisa. Um, and then if you want to follow up, that'd be great. Um, so, you know, depending on the sector that your work belongs to, uh, you are prioritized into either phase 1B or phase 1C. Uh, we have moved into a portion of phase 1B now that uh, we are actively vaccinating individuals that are 65 and older, and uh, hope to move into phase 1C sometime in the early spring. But much of this, again, will depend on the amount of doses that will be coming into the county. And you can actually see more details of who is in each sector by visiting, again, our website, uh, vaccinatelacounty.com. The, the sectors that are currently eligible for vaccination have a sort of green dot next to them, and those that are not ready uh, have a red dot. So it's very easy to sort of understand which groups are currently eligible for vaccinations and which ones are, um, are not. Uh, the determinations regarding who is prioritized are really driven by guidance that's uh, provided to us by the federal government and by the state. Um, at the county level, what we're doing is primarily being uh, responsible for operationalizing these recommendations. I have nothing to add. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Simon. Um, it's uh, someone asking uh, that uh, can you be a carrier of COVID uh, after you received the vaccine? And, and something you related to earlier, which is how quickly does the vaccine work? So the vaccine has been shown to be very effective at preventing symptomatic disease, COVID-19 disease, but the trials, clinical trials, were not able to de definitively determine if the vaccine prevents asymptomatic infection. We're hopeful that it does, but we can't be sure yet that it does. So I cannot say at this point in time that it protects against 
being, quote, a carrier or being asymptomatically um, infected. Um, with regard to how quickly the vaccine uh, exerts an effect, relatively quickly, um, what we saw uh, in the trials is that within seven days of the first dose, people began to manifest protection from, from the virus and then that increases over time. And then with the second dose, you get an additional boost. But we do recommend that uh, even when you've been vaccinated, that very important, you don't assume that you're immediately protected. You continue to take precautions. And then even beyond when we do believe that you have some protection against the virus, you continue to uh, take precautions so that you don't inadvertently uh, spread the virus if indeed you happen to have asymptomatic infection. Great, thank you. And there's a related question on that, Dr. Simon, that I would direct to you as well. Um, can we expect any clinical trials to specifically measure vaccine responses for persons who are on immune suppressants? The initial trials did not include those persons, um, but there's no reason to believe that the vaccines would present any safety risks for that population, number one. Number two, the vaccine may be effective, but we don't yet know. We though are with the rollout uh, of the vaccine now, the numbers who've been vaccinated uh, across the country, I think are around 4 million. So we now have an, a lot, very large ongoing study and there are many persons within that population who've been vaccinated that do have immunosuppressed uh, immunocompromising conditions. And so we will be able to study those folks over time to see how strong a response they do have with, with the vaccine. Thank so you. I guess I would conclude by just saying there's no reason not to get the, the vaccine if you are immunosuppressed in one way or another. We just can't be sure yet how strong the protection will be with the vaccine. And a follow-up to that as well, uh, women who are pregnant, uh, uh, people with chronic disease who maybe have had cancer, but they're in remission. What are some of the thinking in that area? Yeah, folks with chronic conditions were included in the trial and uh, in the two trials. And to our great uh, relief, uh, they did seem to show a good response to the vaccine. They did uh, manifest good protection from vaccination. Um, with pregnancy, uh, again, that population was not included in the vaccine trial, so we don't know for sure. There's no, based on what we know of the vaccine, there's no biological reason to think that it would present a risk to pregnant women. So we're recommending that they be vaccinated, but we do understand that there may be circumstances where uh, a woman who's pregnant would want to talk with her healthcare provider to better understand what the benefits versus the risks might be, particularly if a woman has a high high risk pregnancy, I think it would be important to uh, talk with their provider. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question I guess would be for Dr. Kurian and Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, it deals with logistics of uh, getting in the vaccination. This question says, I don't have a car and it takes forever to get around on the bus. Where can I get the vaccine and how are you making it easy for people who do not have cars or depend on public transportation? Maybe I could take this one uh, for Sarah and feel free to jump in. Um, so the vaccine is available. Uh, best to make an appointment ahead of time at these five megapods. As I mentioned that they are situated across LA County. They are set up as drive-throughs to minimize exposure to all the individuals that are going to be arriving, but we do realize that not everyone has a car. So people can use any form of transportation, if it's a bus or an Uber, what have you, to get to one of the megapods. Um, but once they're there, they can be served on a walk-up basis as well to make it easy for them to be able to receive the service. I don't know, Sarah, if you have something to add. Dr. Curran? Yeah, um, there are some sites also available on our website, which are not purely a, um, a drive up sort of situation. So there, there are uh, sites where folks can actually go to more of a clinical uh, clinic type setting to get uh, vaccinated. Um, so it, it's not completely uh, necessary that you have a vehicle in order to, to get vaccinated. 
Great, thank you. And uh, the next question is addressed uh, to you, Dr. Kurian. Um, and this one relates to uh, the education sector is listed uh, under phase 1B tier 1. And the question is, does this include staff, faculty, and students in higher education, i.e. those that are older than 16, or is it limited to K-12 staff and administration? Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. So th the way that it's actually worded in the guidance uh, is that it's for those who are at risk of exposure at work um, in, the, in the sectors of education and child care. So uh, the focus really would be on the staff um, both in K through, uh, K through 12 and also in institutes of higher education. And again, the goal really is to try and um, get the staff, the folks that are most vulnerable to, uh, to becoming infected, um, protected and vaccinated so that we can return to a situation where um, children uh, do have an opportunity to have on-site education again. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Simon. Uh, this relates to something we've heard about that there have been some anecdotes about people who had COVID and then got infected again. This one relates to the vaccine is how long does the immunity last? Again, we don't know for sure. Um, the clinical trials uh, followed persons for two months after they received their second dose. So we know that protection was strong over that period. They've committed to continuing their trials for another two years. So we'll have that information. There's reason to believe though, given the just how robust the responses were to the vaccines, that, that there will be protection for a matter at least of months, uh, six to 12 months, maybe even longer. Again, we don't know for sure. Similarly with infection, uh, we don't know for sure, but uh, the, the evidence seems to indicate that people do have, most people do have pretty good protection, at least for three months and probably longer. There have been some reported cases of reinfection, but they don't seem to be particularly common. So uh, we'll learn more over time, but I think we can be very confident that over the short term, you know, three to six months, for example, there's, there's good protection. I do want to add one thing, though. I received a note just to clarify one, one uh, issue regarding the safety of the vaccine, um, because there is a lot of concern in the community that it may impact different groups differently. And so I again want to emphasize that in those clinical trials, there was a, a fair amount of diversity in the participants. All racial, major racial and ethnic groups were included. And so, for example, there was there were not, uh, you know, a higher level of adverse events reported in any particular group, not in African-Americans, Latinos, Asians, or any of the other uh, groups that were included. So I think uh, people can feel confident that at least based on their, you know, racial or ethnic identity that there aren't any unique risks. Well, thank you so much. Uh, now we uh, get to move to the questions that are, are being submitted to us uh, in real time. And again, a reminder for our audience, uh, you can submit questions through the comment section of YouTube and Facebook uh, or on Twitter using a hashtag AskCOVIDTownHall. Uh, so um, I want to thank our staff for compiling those questions. And let me see if we have some of them coming in on the chat. And while we're getting those up, um, what, a question I have for the panel you know, we hear a lot of myths about uh, that the vaccine will affect the DNA, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that uh, there's going to be uh, potentially uh, long-term complications or, or to cause uh, you know, autoimmune disease. Um, what would you like the audience to hear about that? Uh, I can start. And then, Dr. Simon, if you want to add, or Dr. Gonzalez, you know, feel free. So, um, you know, again, the way that the mRNA vaccine works, um, it does not enter the cell nucleus. It basically, the role of the mRNA vaccine and, uh, is to sort of uh, help the cell develop um, and create these proteins that resemble the proteins on the surface of the coronavirus uh, uh, virus itself. 
And by doing that, it induces the body's immune system to create antibodies and sort of a very robust uh, immune response. But during that process, the mRNA in the vaccine never enters the cell's nucleus or comes into contact with the individual's DNA. And so there's, there's not that risk of creating any sort of change in the structure of the individual's DNA or having any interaction in, in, as far as that's concerned. Uh, and I would just add one thing that um, that uh, the the mRNA that's in the vaccine is destroyed very quickly by the body within within a day. It it does its thing and then it's it's uh, you know destroyed by the body. So there isn't any lasting effect. Thank you both. Um, you know uh, we'll go to uh, um, also the vaccine hesitancy issue. Uh, you know, clearly uh, there are historic discriminatory activities, like we know the Tuskegee uh, uh, experiment and, and among African-Americans. And actually what is maybe not as well known is that there was the same people were doing a similar experiment in, in Guatemala and El Salvador. So among our Central American community, there's a long memory about those issues too. How do we begin to address the hesitancy issue in, in special populations like African-Americans? Latin Americans who maybe are from Central America, as well as other marginalized communities. Maybe we can start with Dr. Gonzalez and some of the work you're doing. It. Right, well, we're trying to really um, provide true um, the data and facts about what the vaccine does and how it was developed. Um, there we've got on our website a wealth of information about the development of vaccines, as well as who's eligible uh, to receive it. We, as I mentioned before, we, we do understand about this uh, history of distrust. Um, however, this is a back, this is a virus that is disproportionately impacting our communities. Our Latino communities in LA County, in particular, is being uh, disproportionately impacted. And so I think it's very important for individuals to be able to feel safe that this vaccine is actually, as you mentioned earlier, you know, it's not going to alter your DNA. Um, it's not going to be a cause uh, for you to get COVID itself, the disease. Um, and so the best that we can offer is to have individuals go to someone that they trust, that they know and trust, um, that is a credible source to get the facts. Um, and our uh, website, like I said, is a very um, strong, very factual place where individuals can go if they don't have someone in particular that they're comfortable asking and uh, can do all the reading that um, they would like to there to be able to sort of satisfy whatever qualms they have about whether this vaccine is in fact safe or not. Thank you. Just, just to build on one thing that Dr. Gonzalez mentioned, the importance of the messenger. Um, not only is it important to have accurate information, but to make sure that we're working in partnership with community organizations and community leaders because they're the trusted messengers uh, within their communities. And uh, so we wanna make sure they have the information so that they can share it with their community members. Thank you. And Dr. Corian, were you going to add something to that? No, I think my colleagues did a, a, a great job covering it. I, I will say that sort of, you know, um, a uh, sort of a secondary offshoot of having some of our healthcare workers being the, the, the ones who received vaccination sort of um, first is that um, maybe a potential byproduct is that perhaps people will feel that it's a little bit safer seeing that their own physicians, their own nurses, the folks that traditionally take care of them have themselves been vaccinated. Um, so uh, there's a hope that perhaps that byproduct will also instill a little bit more trust in, in folks that might have some hesitancy. Thank you so much. A couple of the questions submitted by our audience, uh, and this comes in multiple parts, so I'll start off with the first part. This is addressed to Dr. Simon, uh, but actually the panel could answer this too. What is the protocol for handling uh, leftover vaccines? And you know, what is the shelf life and how quickly does that need to move? You know, Dr. Curian may have be better able to answer that. I will say that we are committed to preventing any sort of wastage of vaccine and so we, we do monitor very carefully 
where vaccine has been distributed. We make sure that it's being stored properly. And if it has been removed for use, uh, you know, it then needs to be, if it's removed for use, but then isn't used, it needs to, it, it then the, the clock starts ticking in terms of how long it's good. Uh, and uh, we have protocols in place, I think, to to redistribute it, to make sure it gets in people, it's administered promptly. But um, Sarah, do you have anything to add? Yeah, sure. Thanks for starting that off, um, Dr. Simon. I, yes, we, we do. Um, we are very committed to making sure that doses are not wasted, especially since we get such a limited supply of vaccine coming into the county. That is, it is such a critical piece of this whole process. Um, so to that effect, we, we have created uh, protocols, uh, guidance documents to all of, you know, that can be used by any of the facilities that are administering vaccine. It outlines exactly what to do to prevent va wastage. And then if you find yourself in a situation where you either have some additional doses or excess doses, what you can do to uh, ensure that those doses aren't, uh, aren't wasted. Um, so it sort of provides you a lot of sort of step-by-step -step guidance in terms of that uh, process. We also offer um, office hours every morning, seven days a week to facilities who can call in and ask questions and we provide guidance that way. So we really try to maximize our opportunity to be constantly in touch with the folks who um, have vaccine and who have questions uh, and may need some additional guidance about how to manage these issues. Um, in addition, there have been some situations where uh, the, you know, there were some temperature against all odds after, you know, all of this guidance, there's still, you know, there, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're humans and, you know, uh, things happen. And so there's been situations where there have been temperature breaches uh, and vaccine needed to be used very quickly. And so the department has um, even set up sort of what we've been calling like midnight pods to very quickly use the vaccine up before it expires, uh, call in individuals who are either in the current priority groups or uh, in the very next priority group to, to make sure that these doses are not wasted and do get into the arms of um, our, um, our public. Thank you. And um, we hear a lot also on a related uh, question to that, um, the supply line and, and how safe it is to you know, transport something through a refrigerated truck and then it gets to the destination and then how long can the uh, vaccine survive in that environment? Uh, what's, what's sort of the, the current thinking on uh, both Pfizer and Moderna since they're the ones that are out? Yeah, so so Pfizer obviously has, you know, um, some additional requirements. It is required to be maintained in an ultra low temperature freezer, um, which, of course, you know, again, a lot of people may not have. But, you know, when you sign up to be a provider, um, you you do have to uh, record your your access to some of these different uh, materials that are necessary to handle the vaccine uh, and sort of based on that is is how we make determinations about where each of these vaccines go so you know we do not send a Pfizer vaccine to facilities that do not have that storage and handling capability um, and again there is a lot of information that's available on our web pages and uh, around exactly what's required for storage and handling how to maintain um, that uh, cold chain um, but, you know, from the time that you receive the vaccine to when you're actually administering the vaccine so that it, you don't have these temperature breaches like I noted earlier. Uh, and then again, with all of these opportunities through either our office hours or other communications, if there's any concern or uh, lack of clarity in any of that information, there's opportunities to get that clarified. Great, thank you. And uh, a follow-up on the same question is, how can uh, leftover vaccines be distributed in a fair way that respects the priority tiers, but just does not allow people with privilege, uh, mainly those who are wealthy or well-connected, to jump the line? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And I know that's something uh, that a lot of folks have questions about. And again, um, we, we do try and go into a lot of detail in our uh, wastage management guides around how to do that. So some of this might be, for example, telling clinics ahead of time to identify folks, you know, either within their facility or in their neighborhood who meet the priority um, uh, characteristics to have them sort of on standby 
if they need to use up doses quickly. So that rather than giving it to, you know, their friend or, or someone who isn't in the current priority group, they can reach out to these individuals and have them come in. So sort of have them on speed dial, call them in if you need them. Something we're hearing anecdotally uh, in, in, in this question is, uh, how can people be discouraged from signing up for the vaccine and then not showing up and wasting that valuable slot? Uh, you know, it hopefully it's not happening that often, but I, I, even at uh, in, in East LA, we're hearing that's happening occasionally. So how do we protect against that? Well, one thing I think is to, to overbook, just as we do in a clinic environment sometimes, uh, we, we anticipate what the no-show rate will be and then uh, over schedule to make sure that we optimize the time. A follow, uh, another question is um, refers to home care workers and I'll ask it a little bit more broadly in the sense that, um, you know, Dr. Vicki Mays at UCLA talks about there's essential workers but there's also essential work, right? The essential worker may actually be working from home, so they don't necessarily need to be the first priority to be protected, but the ones who are actually in the front lines need to be identified. And then there are people who are not labeled essential workers because they're adult caregivers to an elderly loved one, for example, who may be at risk as well. So how do we uh, begin to plan how to reach those individuals, e either as officially healthcare workers or those that are supporting a family member through healthcare work. I'm happy to take that question. So, um, uh, so actually, home health workers, uh, home care, and those that are employed through um, in-home um, uh, services. Are, are actually, they qualify for vaccination right now. They are actually part of the priority uh, group in phase 1A. So we are making efforts right now to reach out to these groups to notify them of their eligibility for vaccination because we do recognize that they are also part of that critical um, uh, healthcare provider uh, priority group. And, um... Something related to that is uh, we're hearing from uh, nursing homes, long-term care, which were part of phase 1A, um, that they're having more success vaccinating clients because they have a medical director or they're able to reach the primary physician, but there's a lot of hesitancy amongst the staff, uh, many of whom are the groups we talked about being vulnerable, Latinx, African-American, and others. Um, so what can we do to begin to reach out to them and, and uh, be more successful at uh, having them participate in the vaccination process? Um, oh, sure. sorry. Oh, go oh. ahead. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I, I'll start. Um, I'm, I'm extremely concerned about this, actually. I, I, this... this you know, this, these vaccines are such a gift. We, we have to take advantage of this opportunity. I don't think anybody expected the efficacy of these vaccines to be as high as they are. And so um, it really saddens me when I see, particularly healthcare professionals that don't take advantage of it. I think we need a more personal touch. Um, you know, I think just putting the messages out there won't necessarily persuade. And I think we need to use social networks so, uh, you know, physician leaders like you, Dr. Flores, and others that are working in the trenches that uh, interact with uh, these various uh, worker communities and can directly message, I think, the benefits. Um, it's more labor intensive, and, and working in such a big county like this, it's very challenging. But unless we, we go deep into communities, I think it's going to continue to be challenging. Dr. Curran, I think you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to add um, um, to what Dr. Simon just said. I think one of the things that can also be very helpful is for those uh, individuals who do get the vaccine um, to be able to maybe even just post it on their own social media and share it with their friends and with their families so that they have, they, your circle of influence, if you will, is able to see, look, you know, I know this person. This person got it and they're reporting 
you know, they feel fine, or maybe they had a little bit of an arm soreness or something along those lines. But, you know, true stories from people that they know being shared with them, uh, I think would go also a long way to getting more people to accept the vaccine. This question, this question, next question is uh, for Dr. Curian. Um, I tried to sign up my grandmother for the vaccine today and I couldn't find an appointment. Uh, when will more be available? Yeah, that's a good question. I know it's uh, something that a lot of folks are struggling with, um, especially today as we, we sort of opened up uh, vaccination slots to a large uh, additional group of folks. So, um, you know, the, these slots or these appointments are really, again, sort of dependent on how much vaccine that we get in. Um, there are uh, there are a few from what I am reading uh, and you know, sort of catching up on emails. There there are a few slots available, but they might be um, further out. Um, so, you know, you can keep checking back on the, the web page and see we do try and upload new um, appointments. Uh, usually at least weekly, if not more, uh, more frequently, as soon as we know that uh, we have vaccine doses available to give to partners and to give to some of these sites. So I'd say just keep checking. Um, we should have more appointments up uh, soon. And could you give the website again? I think it was Vaccinate LA. Yeah, it's VaccinateLACounty.com. Right, thank you. And is there a phone number that goes with it uh, for those that don't have access to the internet? Um, yes, there is. Um, I think they've been experiencing extremely high um, high call volumes today, though. So what I would say is, you know, if you have an ability to check online, that would be the preferable way to do this at the moment. Uh, of course, if you don't have access to the internet, um, then by all means, you know, uh, try the call center. Uh, you might have some longer wait time. So just, you know, um, to just be patient. The number for the call center is 833-540-0433. Um, and uh, they are open between 8 a.m. and 8.30 p.m. And it is available seven days a week. But again, uh, I would just caution that if you have the ability um, to try going online first, that would probably be preferable just to save you a bit of time um, staying on, on the line. Great, thank you very much, that's helpful. Um, and this would be to the panel as well. Um, uh, when can non-citizens, and in particular undocumented individuals, get the vaccine in Los Angeles County? And is it safe for them to get it, get it without fear? Uh, let me let me start. Um, so individuals who are um, getting the vaccine are getting it regardless of their uh, legal status in the in the county. So we are not asking at any point in time, either when individuals are scheduling their appointment or when they show up on site to actually get the vaccine about what their immigration status is. It's simply not a question. So if you are part of the group that is high risk, such as you're a healthcare worker or you are 65 and over, regardless of whether you are here um, and you're legally documented or you're, or you're undocumented is not a factor. You should be able to get the vaccine um, and, and no one will ever even ask you about that. So it's as long as your group is up, um, of your, your risk group, I should say, um, is eligible. As Dr. Korean uh, mentioned that on our website, we have you know a little green dot, red dot system so that it's easy to, for people to see if there's a green dot next to a group that you belong to, like age 65 and over. If it's green, it means you're eligible. And that is regardless of your immigration status. And it's always free. Okay, thank you. That's a great response. Uh, this question you touched on Dr. Simon earlier, uh, but it's worth repeating. Uh, this individual says, I am taking several medications for rheumatoid arthritis that suppress my immune system. Does this situation put me in high risk with the vaccine? Well, it puts you at increased risk for severe COVID disease. So I think it, it adds an extra, I think, um, you know, rationale for getting the vaccine. There's no reason to believe that the vaccine would cause any specific harm based on your immunosuppressed status. So I would recommend getting the vaccine, but if you have specific concerns, I always recommend you know, reaching out to your healthcare provider to, to sort of talk through the specifics. 
And uh, as they're loading up a couple more questions, uh, just the general, and I don't know if you've had a chance to think about this, we're all still learning President-elect Biden's plan for COVID, but to the extent that you're familiar with what uh, the administration, future administration's thinking, how does that provide synergy to what we're trying to do here? And uh, what can we do to start getting more engaged with the president's plan? Well, there's been an announcement of, uh, you know, a commitment to direct a large sum of money uh, down to states and local jurisdictions to, you know, not only for vaccination and, and disease control efforts, but I think for economic relief. Of course, that will depend, I think, on, you know, on the cooperation of, of Congress. Uh, so it remains uncertain. Um, but but I will say that there is a hope for better communication, more transparency, and more consistency in messaging. I think uh, it's been well recognized that we, we've been hampered, I think, by by disparate messaging and very confusing messaging, and uh, it's created a lot of problems for us. So we're hoping that that pattern um, ends. Other panel members, anything to add? Dr. Crane? Yeah, no, I think Dr. Simon, you covered it well. You know, there is um, there there is a hope that, you know, we will see, um, you know, uh, a greater degree of sort of transparency and clarity around uh, the availability of vaccine and how much vaccine will also be coming into the to the state and then uh, down to the county um, so that we have an opportunity to do a lot more sort of advanced planning uh, and preparation. Um, so so uh, we're looking forward to seeing what's in the, on the horizon and, uh, and uh, feeling pretty optimistic about that. And the next question is for Dr. Kurian. Um, it kind of refers to people's fear of getting turned away when they've gone to get a, a vaccine at a, one of the large pods. Uh, it says, I have an appointment uh, on January 24 for my grandma at Magic Mountain, but it says for healthcare worker only, will they still vaccinate her? So assuming your your grandmother is over the age of 65, um, yes, they, they, they will be taking her. Uh, they are, you know, um, updating the websites, making sure that that information is all available. Uh, they do have information also about uh, what individuals that are over the age of 65 need to bring in in, in terms of verification. They have a variety of different um, uh, documents or IDs that you can bring in. So it doesn't have to be a driver's license. They offer a variety of different options. But yes, they will. Uh, if she's over the age of 65, they, they will vaccinate her. And uh, this is for the panel as well. Uh, how uh, is public health reaching out to uh, those who are homeless or at risk of being homeless? So, so I can start that um, uh, that response. So we do. We actually have individuals that have been assigned to. Um, interact uh, with individuals in all of our various priority groups across the tiers and the phases to understand sort of what their unique needs are uh, and to make sure that those are accounted for in terms of our vaccination planning. Uh, we also have liaison groups that have been working with individuals from, um, you know, with those experiencing homelessness from the uh, start of this pandemic. and. Uh, we're uh, leveraging some of those relationships that have been there from the beginning to, again, really understand how best to reach out to this community uh, and ensure that they have access to vaccination. And uh, a follow-up is uh, how many vaccinations can each of the mega sites um, sort of administer? And uh, will, when will the public know about appointments available? Uh, no, very good question. So um, right now, the uh, these large sites are set up to um, man at least about 2,400 vaccinations a day at each one of these sites. Uh, they're hoping to potentially ramp up. Again, a lot of this is going to depend on how much vaccine comes into our county next week. Um, and in terms of appointments, uh, you know, again, just check back on the website. Uh, see, you know, check frequently to see when new appointments might uh, new appointments might open up. We do try again to have them at least weekly, but uh, 
uh, are trying as much as possible to do it on a rolling basis. Well, thank, thank you. And, and just to repeat, the, uh, the website is vaccinatelacounty.com. And uh, the number is 833-540-0473. So, great, thank you. Uh, the, the next question is for Dr. Simon or Dr. Curian. It says, I am 53 years old and have several underlying health conditions. When can I get a vaccine? That's a great question. You're, if, I, if I'm in your shoes, I would be somewhat frustrated because uh, we can't give you a definitive answer. You clearly are at some increased risk for COVID illness, uh, but given the current, current uh, phase groupings, um, you know, defined by both the CDC and the state, you would fall into phase 1C, I believe. Sarah, you can correct me if, wrong, if I'm wrong. And we're not yet sure when we will be able to expand vaccination to, to that population. Um, if vaccine supply ramps up quickly, uh, you know, things will move, move quicker. Um, but it really is dependent on the, the supplies that we receive over the next, uh, you know, 48 weeks. Thank you. Uh, and the, the panel's touched on this before. This is addressed to Dr. Curry and Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, how do I get the vaccine if I am unemployed? Um, I can start uh, if you want to chime in, Eloisa. Um, so again, the vaccine is offered uh, is offered free of charge. Um, it is sort of dependent again on which sector that you uh, that you belong to. Uh, so if you're currently unemployed and you're at home, um, your risk is considered to be pretty minimal. Um, but if you are employed in some sort of volunteer type activity in a particular sector that is eligible for vaccination. So for example, um, we have instructed our facilities, even in phase 1A, that have um, individuals that are paid or unpaid working for them. Uh, they, sh they should be considered as part of the priority group if they are doing, you know, for example, patient-related activities. So simply being unemployed does not exclude you from being vaccinated. It really is related to what your risks are in terms of the activities that you're involved with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for one more question before we uh, ask our panelists to give us their final uh, comments. So uh, this one's addressed to Dr. Simon. Uh, if I get Pfizer for my first dose, do I have to get Pfizer for my second dose or can I get Moderna? You should stick with the same vaccine you got for your first dose, very important. Um, mixing doses has not been studied. So uh, it would be much better to stick with the same dose. That, that We understand that requires some, some planning. Uh, when you do go in for your first dose of vaccine, you'll get a card that lists the vaccine that you've received, the date you received it, and, and the date you need to get your your boost, your second uh, dose. And, uh, and you'll need to, when you register, you'll be directed to a site uh, that is using the same vaccine, but uh, you may wanna just confirm that when you arrive, making sure that you're getting the same vaccine. And uh, kind of a related question is, uh, if I get Pfizer, do I have to get it exactly three weeks or is there some wiggle room? Uh, same thing with Moderna. Do I have to get it in four weeks? There's always wiggle room. You don't want to get it sooner. Uh, ideally, you want to get it pretty close to that 21 day mark for Pfizer or the 28 day mark for Moderna. But if for whatever reason it's delayed, even if it were to be delayed several months, that's not ideal. But if it were to be delayed several months, you still would want to get that second dose. So you don't want to give up and just say, forget it. I'm not going to get that second dose. Great. Well, thank you. I want to thank our panelists for a wonderful presentation and willingness to take questions. I want to thank our audience for joining us and spending a large part of their evening with us. Um, so I want to give our panelists a chance to give final comments. And we'll go in alph alphabetical order. So we'll start with Dr. Eloisa Gonzalez. 
Thanks. Well, I really just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, I really want to emphasize that our Latino community is being impacted disproportionately by COVID now, and vaccination is a very important tool to help keep us safe. My sister and my parents are getting the vaccine tomorrow, and I hope that everyone who's over 65 and that works in healthcare, which are the groups that are currently eligible, uh, will go to vaccinatelacounty.com tonight and schedule their vaccine. And for those who don't have a green dot next to them and they're not quite eligible, just continue to go to vaccinatelacounty.com and check regularly and uh, keep an eye out for that little green dot. And then as soon as they see that, go ahead and schedule. Uh, Dr. Curran. Sorry, just uh, um, yeah. Again, I just also just want to echo something that uh, Dr. Gonzalez said. Just you know, very, very grateful for this opportunity to to come and join you again um, to answer questions, uh, and really sort of grateful that the community is interested and engaged and wants to learn more about vaccines, and um, hopefully as a result or a consequence of that, that you will. Um, feel motivated to go out and get vaccinated yourself. I do just want to to um, comment that you know we have had really huge call volumes today, especially as we've expanded out to this new population, and a tremendous number of hits on our website. So I know that folks out there might be having some challenges with um, it, and issues with the website and also with the phone line. Uh, please bear with us as we kind of work through this and. Uh, you know, put in systems to kind of help support these call lines and make sure the website is up and available and, and um, accessible to everyone. Um, but yes, as Dr. Gonzalez said, uh, you know, please come back, visit the site regularly, um, make sure that you're you're in one of those priority groups, and then you can sign up for uh, for vaccination. Um, and and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Curran, and uh, Dr. Simon. Likewise, I want to thank everyone for joining this evening. And Dr. Flores, I want to thank you for serving as a moderator. Um, I want to urge everybody to try to be patient. And I know that's that's a hard message given how much everybody has suffered over this past year. And we, we feel it acutely, uh, as you all do. It's been now 10 months of living in many cases at many points in time in, in pretty significant social isolation, not being able to do the things that we all love, love to do, uh, having to face restrictions that are very disruptive. Um, there is some light at the end of the tunnel, um, but it's not gonna happen overnight. Um, we have to vaccinate millions of people um, in LA County, at least 6 million adults. And even in the best of circumstances, if the vaccine supply goes up quickly over the, the, the coming weeks, it's still going to take time. So we, we urge your patience. Um, we do appreciate all the efforts you've made to help uh, reduce the spread of the virus. We're seeing some promising uh, signs in the data right now, actually, that we may be uh, coming through the worst of it. I, I don't want to say that. With complete confidence yet, the numbers are still very, very high. And we do urge you to continue to be as diligent as possible in, in adhering to the precautions, particularly as we um, you know, have learned about this new variant that could be more infectious. It just raises the stakes even more. So hang in there. And again, thank you tonight for joining. And uh, we look forward to... Uh, you know, better times here as, as we have more vaccine supply. Great. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure to serve as your moderator. Um, I'm a big fan of public health, um, you know, from Dr. Ferrer, Dr. Davis, to all of you. You guys are exemplary in your compassion and commitment to help our, our county get through this. Uh, as has been mentioned earlier, it's a massive challenge with, you know, 10 million people, 88 cities, and whole bunch of different ways to look at how to solve the problem. And so I commend you for the work that you're doing. A colleague of mine, Dr. Louise McCarthy, uh, who is the uh, executive director of the Community Clinic Association, likes to say that LA County is too big to fail, but too big to make it. So you guys are actually beating the odds. So I appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, and really the, uh, for our audience, thank you. Uh, among the health professionals who are in the audience, once you get vaccinated, please, please consider volunteering to be part of the workforce that continues to vaccinate 
the hardest to reach population. So thank you again. Good night to everybody and uh, uh, stay safe and be healthy. Thank you.